everyone and welcome to our webinar cultural awareness session on Chinese culture and language. First of all, I have to thank you all for taking the time from your very busy schedules. I know we're coming up to Christmas and we're all trying to make sure that we finish off those things before Christmas comes in. So I do really appreciate you taking the time today. My name is Fatih Krakus and I'm the trainer and PD coordinator at All Graduates Interpreting and Translation. Um, now, today's session continues All Graduates program of familiarizing its clients with the communities that are served by interpreting and translation services. And in today's session, attention will be paid to the varieties of the Chinese language and the correct identification of Chinese varieties when requesting language services, as well as outlining basic cultural characteristics of the Chinese speaking community in Australia. Now, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. I uh, would like to inform you all that the webinar is being recorded and all of you that have registered today will be emailed with a link to the recording tomorrow. Having said that, the video will also be made available on our YouTube channel. Uh, we have a section there on cultural awareness, a playlist there, um, where you can uh, access our previously uh, recorded webinars on other different cultures and uh, languages as well. Uh, certificate of attendance. So all of you that have registered today will be emailed a certificate of attendance um, in one day. Uh, so today is for, uh, Monday, so you should be getting it around this time tomorrow. Um, also would like to inform you that this is an interactive webinar. So please, if you have any comments and questions, you can put it into the GoToWebinar app chat function or the question function there, um, and then they'll come through to me and I will then uh, ask those questions to Dr. Aldous as well as the panel as well. Um, so before we get too carried away, I'd like to present you um, our chair for today. We have Dr. Aldous Ozolins. Um, he will be chairing today's panel. Uh, now, Dr. Aldous Ozolins is a very well-known teacher, researcher, and writer uh, within the interpreting and translating uh, field and industry. Um, and he also has an international reputation. So we are very lucky indeed to have him here today. Um, and he chairs all of our cultural awareness sessions. So thank you very much, Dr. Aldous, uh, for making the time as well. Uh, he has been teaching in uh, several Australian universities over the last uh, few decades maybe I should say, uh, Aldous, without giving too much away on your age. Um, and uh, <laughs> Most recently at Western Sydney University where he was the head of the languages and the translating and interpreting department for several years. Uh, so over to you now Aldous, thank you very much. Good, thank you and uh, welcome to this um, seminar. I understand we have a large number of participants which is very good. Um, because uh, the Chinese culture and language uh, is now very prominent in Australia um, and Chinese issues are uh, really at the head of the table, often both internally and externally. Um, now, we have uh, today a panel of experts because I'm not the specific experts on uh, Chinese. Um, and if I can go through the panelists, uh, and get them to introduce themselves. Satiano Chow, uh, originally from Hong Kong, Cantonese and Mandarin interpreter and a translator. Lydia Tsai from Taiwan, Mandarin and Taiwanese interpreter. Richard Wong, uh, originally from Malaysia, uh, has a whole string of uh, language varieties, Mandarin, Hakka Chinese, Hokkien, Timorese Hakka, and a translator as well. He's very, very busy. And Dr. Han Shu, freshly out of her PhD from the mainland of the People's Republic of China, Mandarin interpreter and Chinese translator. Uh, I will get uh, each of you to introduce yourselves. Satsiano, can we begin with you? Thank you, Udus. And hello, everyone. My name is Cassiano. I first worked in uh, the language services field in, back in Hong Kong in 1981. Among the work I have done in Hong Kong, I spent eight years working as a simultaneous interpreter in the government. After migration to um, Australia, I have worked a few years as a freelance uh, interpreter and translator, 
before joining the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department as a translator in 1998. However, time flies. I worked uh, in the government uh, for 22 years, uh, and then I retired actually from the Home Affairs Department a few months ago. So um, I practiced uh, just like what Uda said, um, both uh, Mandarin and Cantonese. However, Cantonese is my mother tongue or native tongue. Thank you. Good, thank you. And uh, uh, Lydia Tsai, uh, originally from Taiwan. Lydia, let's hear from you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lydia. I come from Taiwan. And I've been in Australia for more than 20 years. Um, I'm actually relatively new in the Mandarin sort of interpreting field. I've only been working in, as an interpreter for about three, four years, full time. Um, previously, I was an accountant. Um, but um, but I'm always quite fascinated quite interested um, in this field and um, I'm always learning and I feel that I'm really privileged to be here today. Thank you. Good, thank you. And Richard Wong, um, tell us a few things about yourself. Yeah, I always feel difficult to introduce myself. <laughs> so anyway, I was born in Malaysia, Malaya, uh, then grown up in Singapore. So, so in in Malaya, there's apart from speaking Mandarin, they also speak the other dialect. So I pick up the other dialect as well. Depend on especially the Hokkien, because the Hokkien population is bigger. So then you mix up with the group, then you have to speak Hokkien, you know, like that. And I have been teacher, public servant, uh, so that, that's it, you know. <laughs> so I don't have much to say about myself. <laughs> okay, I think you'll have a lot more to say as we go along. And uh, uh, Han Shu, uh, please tell us a few things about yourself. Okay, thank you, Udis. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Han. Um, I'm a professional interpreter uh, and a translator working in uh, working in Mandarin. So I'm a native speaker of Mandarin, and I was born in mainland China. Um, I received systematic training in interpreting and translation um, in an MA program in China. I moved to Australia in 2014. Um, I moved. Um, I came to Australia. I come here to do a PhD at the University of New South Wales. Um, so I look at um, how interpreting is used in legal settings. So um, I completed my PhD in early 2019, and soon after that, I um, I taught interpreting for a short while at Monash University. And now um, I'm an interpreting translation practitioner, research and trainer based in Brisbane. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, um, what we'll be uh, looking at in the um, in this session today, uh, we'll look at the Chinese language and its various varieties, both spoken and written. Um, we'll look at the varieties in Australia. We'll look at uh, language spoken at home by um, how well English is spoken um, from the census. Uh, we'll um, have a look at just making sure we can all get requests for uh, Chinese language right, because there are so many varieties to think about. Um, a little bit on the settlement history in Australia, which is a very interesting story. Um, and finally, um, some issues about and hints about communication with Chinese communities. Okay, firstly, I want to cover the Chinese language varieties, and I want to cover the two um, written varieties that are used. The, what's known as the traditional script, um, which is used in uh, many areas outside of the um, uh, People's Republic of China, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, throughout the diaspora, um, and the simplified script, and that's used in 
the mainland of, of the People's Republic of China, but it is also promoted increasingly. Um, so if you go off to learn Chinese anywhere, um, you're likely to be learning the simplified script. Now, why on earth are there two scripts? Um, and how can we understand this? Now, if you just visually have a look at the two scripts, you can already see some differences. The first four characters are the name of the language in Chinese. After that comes a short extract. It's a, a health warning regarding COVID. Um, but you can see even from the first four characters, some differences. There are two characters which are the same, the two characters which um, I suppose you can say in the simplified script, they're less messy, there's less, less, less busy, less, um, fewer strokes. Um, and uh, likewise, as we go into the text, we can see some things don't change, um, but there's a number where there seem to be, the character is a bit simplified and others where the character is actually quite different. Um, so there's these changes. Um, Tatiana, maybe we can start off with you uh, and the traditional script. And apart from telling us how many thousands of years this traditional script has been used, um, maybe you can you can say how widely it's it's used and uh, um, why we still have a traditional script when we also seem to have a simplified script. Well, you have posed me a real challenge. Um, now look, the same question was also asked by my Caucasian colleague when I work, work as a senior staff linguist in the Home Affairs Department. It's a long story, uh, as long as uh, the history of China goes. Actually, um, we believe that, or people usually believe that uh, the original Chinese characters evolve or based on pictograms. So basically, um, this is, uh, this is uh, the main belief. Of course, uh, in between thousands of years, there must be many other considerations. But anyway, it started as pictograms. As a result, um, for some uh, complex as well as uh, uh, different ideas, for example, uh, so uh, it become the traditional characters. Um, you have asked me many, many questions, but the reason why it still remains, I think, uh, would be difficult to answer mainly because, of course, uh, it is a matter of uh, familiarity, as well as uh, how, uh, just like what uh, Richard uh, has said, how uh, how the original young children or students were taught. So I believe that, uh, say, in the case of uh, Hong Kong, for example, as well as uh, allow me to, to quote Lydia, uh, in Taiwan, then, of course, uh, all along, when, uh, when we were kids, uh, when we start doing kindergarten upward, uh, all along, we use uh, the traditional characters uh, to, uh, uh, as the Chinese words to describe ourselves as well as to describe things, etc. So, um, well, I think first of all, I should stop here and uh, listen to my fellow colleagues as well. Thank you. Okay, and um, uh, Hanshu, uh, can you tell us why we have a simplified script? What was the logic behind it? Uh, how long we have had a simplified script, and um, uh, well, let's start with that. Okay, um, I think you know to understand why we have simplified script, we need first to be aware of um, a timeline. So first, we need to um, know that um, the First Republic of China it was established in 1949. So um, back then. Uh, when China, when New China was first uh, was first established, uh, there was an urgent need to develop economy. However, back then conditions were not very good, especially people um, level of education. Back then, back in the 1949 or early 1950s, um, most of Chinese people they live in rural areas. About 80 percent of the population they live in rural areas, and most of these people uh, they were illiterate, so they can't read. And plus, back then we use um, traditional Chinese characters, so it was um, it was difficult. There were um, there are more strokes, um, as Udi mentioned. It's more it's busier, so it could be difficult for people to learn, to understand, to start to read, to write. So uh, government at that time, so uh, they started a movement 
the movement the movement started in about in the mid of 1950s. So the the Chinese government back then they wanted to make um, Chinese easier for people to learn to understand. So they simplified the Chinese characters to make them have less strokes. So it's easier to write and it's easier for people to understand. And since then we have started to use simplified uh, Chinese characters. And for me, um, I was born in the uh, I was born in the late 1980s. So I have always started to learn um, simplified Chinese, and I can read some traditional Chinese because the uh, those characters are still very similar to each other. But since um, since about uh, since the 1950s, uh, the simplified uh, script has been um, um, popularized in China, and in fact, uh, the official um, ca Chinese character that are used in the UN for China is simplified Chinese, so it becomes official since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thanks. And one one issue that that does come up a lot um, is this issue of well, do most Chinese read both or read one and do we have to have two translations made and so on? Um, yeah, and, and that's that's a question obviously which language service providers ask because uh, it's it's something that, that is, um, uh, well, it's also money. Yes. Can I say uh, something about, yeah. about this? Yeah, Richard, now, please, yes. Uh, of course, when the simplified version was introduced, it sort of become a political uh, issue because Taiwan would not accept anything that changed by the by the new government, you know, after forty nine. So there's always very sensitive, and anything that the mainland China China introduced, then the Taiwan <laughs> would not agree with it. So the Taiwan would stick to the traditional script and and all those things. But until the United Nations recognize the simplified Chinese as acceptable as a script, then it start to, to lessen the political sensitivity. Uh, so the, the simplified version was used, but people who had the the traditional script background, they start to learn the the simplified one, and they are mixed up. They sort of half half. <laughs> so yeah. nowadays, you ask a Chinese to write hundred percent traditional script, he can't. <laughs> if you ask him to write the simplified script, also not easy. Uh, hundred percent, I'm talking about. So we a bit of mix mixing. I yeah. think that in future the the Nati will have to allow you can use both can use both uh, to do it of course the background of the simplified chinese uh, just now dr uh, she had mentioned to make it easier for uh, for the common people to write to express uh, so that is one thing the like for example the Co Korean and Japanese, they had succeeded that in changing the script to more simplified one. They had they, they meant to do it. Uh, of course, the Chinese now also use a lot of uh, now common commonly. It, it's not become a. I remember in Singapore, you are not allowed to use the simplified one. No, the teacher wouldn't allow you, the government wouldn't allow you. But then now it's after the United Nations recognition of the simplified script, then it becomes a non-political uh, sensitivity, you know? So. Okay, I would like uh, to add on to that. Please, please do, Is because okay? Richard uh, jumped in with Taiwan before I asked you to do so. <laughs> I have to speak for Taiwan now. Uh, well, well, from my research, there was only about 7,000 word, simplified words. Uh, so in terms of when you use the Chinese language, um, there would still be that some, a lot of words are still 
in traditional script. Um, that's one of the main reasons. Another thing is, um, apart from the pictogram that um, Dr. Chow was saying before, um, the Chinese words, they were also from like different, they, they were from six different branches. So either, uh, either from pictograms, there are ideograms, there are ideogrammic compounds, all different. So people can tell from the, the traditional script, from maybe the radicals of the words, to maybe sound the word properly, or to understand the meaning of the words properly. I think that is, um, so in Taiwan, I think the government was trying to do it so for people to really understand where the words come from, and just from looking at the words. And um, yeah, so that's definitely um, kind of like to keep on the tradition, I would say. Um, yeah, so I do see, and also um, I, I, I did part of the Chinese here in Australia as well. So when I, when I was doing Chinese in Australia, my uni uh, professor actually told me that when you study um, Chinese in a sort of um, master or PhD in China, you need to learn traditional script because that's how you can cover all different words and then see maybe the origin of the words come from. And I totally and uh, I totally agree that simplified version, yes, in terms of writing and um, yeah, you will make things much easier for people to learn. Um, but when you come, when you goes to the meaning of the words, how it comes from, the traditional script is still the way to go. Good, right. Uh, thanks. Um, I think we've got a question from, uh, oh, Shati, have you got a question? Yes, indeed we have. Thank you very much, Aldous. Um, I've got a question from one of our attendees and the question is, are the two variations very different? Can one understand one and not the other? Uh, Han, Han, uh, you had your hand up. Sorry, may, maybe answer, answer that too. Yes. Uh Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry to jump in with this. So I think to answer your um your previous question about the clients, so which one should we use? I think it's always important for um for the agency to have um to ask clients first. So where is the translation work is going to be um, used? If it is in the mainland China, I would um see um. You know, I would see that um, most of the cases it should be simplified, uh, simplified Chinese characters. If it will be in Taiwan or in Hong Kong or in some um, other parts of the world, um, maybe it would be traditional Chinese. So always ask the clients so which um, Chinese characters that we should use. And reg regarding the question from the audience, so uh, are these two um, very different? Uh, for me, I'm a native speaker um, of Mandarin, so I only learned to read Mandarin. Um, I would say those two characters um, are not hugely different. So um, uh, even for me, I have never uh, I have never learned to um, learn to read traditional Chinese. I can still roughly understand uh, the traditional Chinese characters. I mean, roughly um, eighty percent or ninety percent. Yes. I totally agree with Dr. Xu. Sorry to jump in. Um, yes, because I um, I pick up my simplified script here in Australia. So I, I feel that people can actually read uh, from context, even if we can't read uh, individual words. So we can read the whole paragraph and understand the meaning. That should, shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Satiano. Yes. Now, I want to uh, provide uh, further information about the practical level, the service delivery level. Well, actually, the two different types of scripts or characters are more than just uh, a difference or change in forms. And uh, uh, Udas, earlier on, you mentioned that, uh, yes, uh, that's, that's very true, of course. For most IMT agencies, in fact, uh, people are uh, engaging two different translators to provide uh, the different versions uh, in traditional versus simplified characters. And of course, uh, there are good reasons behind that. Um, this is preferable because uh, there are differences, not just in whether it is traditional, more complex or simplified, uh, less complex characters. In fact, uh, there are differences in their parts of speech, uh, uh, part of speech as well. So for example, there are different idiomatic ways to express the same verbs 
or the same NAS. So that's why, in fact, um, it's not just about the fonts, but about uh, the lexicology, et cetera, that uh, um, the, uh, they might be using. Also concerning people who can uh, read both, just like what Lydia said, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Su Xu said, of course, uh, we language practitioners usually can read both, um, including myself. But then I think we still uh, want the options, mainly because it is about familiarity as well as about reading comfort. So we have to get Therefore, I think for the translators, in fact, uh, there is another implication here because uh, translators, while we uh, may all be qualified as Chinese translators, we should have broad linguistics uh, knowledge and adopt an open mind uh, in case uh, they are handling both scripts at the same time. That means, yes, sometimes for practical reasons, uh, we may be providing uh, simplified as well as the traditional character versions. In that case, we really, we really have to be open-minded, irrespective of whether we are from Hong Kong or Taiwan or from mainland China. When we describe the same things, remember to you, to me, uh, we may have a preferred uh, way of uh, describing, but then we need to think about our readers. So it is more important that we think about what our readers would understand concerning a particular concept. So I hope uh, this also helped to uh, clarify the uh, differences between the two scripts. Thank you. Um, look, uh, we've got one more question and we're not going to spend all the hour and a half on the, <laughs> on the written script, so we'll move on. But one more question, Party. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have here a question from the Project Manager of Cultural Partners um, and uh, Fiona Jones is uh, asking the question. Uh, has social media impacted the use of both scripts or are they both used in social media? They're both used in social media. Yeah, both both, yeah used in social media. And you'll find that especially, I think in Taiwan especially, uh, our even YouTube channels, they all have um, traditional script subtitles. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, which is quite a little bit different from here. Like the TVs, you when you switch on TV, there's no um, sub, sub, sub yes, yeah, no subtitles. But in Taiwan, yes, that is always traditional ones. Yeah. Good. Okay. Can I thanks. One, one, one point. One point. <laughs> Um, you know, we are now talking about uh, traditional script or simplified script like that. But uh, looking forward that, you know, in 30 or 50 years, we may not use any more of them. Because, the, I don't know, it's mainland China, whether they're still looking for internationalized the language or not. If they do, that means they would probably use ABC to express the, the sound of the Chinese uh, language. So if that is the way, then in 30 years or 50 years, we'll completely use the international language. Uh, at the moment, they already developed the pin-in uh, system. This pin system actually is Latinized, Latinized the Chinese. Uh, so in future, uh, maybe if, if international life is successful, then we won't see any more of this Chinese script anymore. We will see ABC, you know, like Ni Hao will be U N I, now H A O. You look at it, Ni Hao, you, you understand. So also easy for anyone in the whole world to learn the, the Chinese. So I'm thinking. Of course, this one is far ahead, you know, maybe 30, <laughs> 50 years. There are only two countries who had internationalized the Chinese script. One is Japan, J Japan. the other one is the uh, Vietnam. You know, Vietnam had really fully romanized their language. They used to be using the Chinese script, but now they are romanized it. So it happened to Japan, it happened to, to Vietnam. It can happen to China. 
you know. Okay. I don't uh, know. There will be a lot of lover for the Chinese script, uh, written star. They might not want to give up. You never know. Yeah. That's a very bold prediction. Um, <laughs> just one last thing on this written thing. Um, in terms of the terminology to use, always use Chinese when referring to written translation. Um, and then specify traditional or simplified, because as we'll see, there isn't necessarily a one-to-one a -one correlation between, for example, Mandarin and, and simplified script. Um, so uh, let's go on to something more complicated, um, and that is the spoken varieties. And uh, um, the uh, main uh, spoken variety, Mandarin, uh, widely spoken in the mainland of People's Republic of China, uh, also spoken in Taiwan. Um, and of course, here we note that in Taiwan, uh, it's mostly Mandarin that's spoken, but as we heard, they use the traditional script. Um, uh, Han Shu, can you tell us a little bit about Mandarin, its origins? Um, and uh, uh, I think it's uh, very um, important to understand where Mandarin actually comes from because there are so many varieties of, of spoken Chinese. Okay, so Mandarin for now, when we see Mandarin, people usually call it Putonghua in Chinese. So Mandarin is like the official um, or the standard Chinese that people most people would uh, speak in mainland parts of China. So this is the language that is taught um, in, in at schools. So children, uh, when they start go, uh, when they start to go to school, they learn to speak Mandarin. But actually, um, these stars, uh, I, 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 these stars also um, it starts with the establishment of New China. Uh, it makes this um, so Mandarin is more like uh, one accent. So it's, it is like one accent because China, especially the mainland part of China, it is very big. There are many different provinces. Usually people from different provinces, they speak with different accents. And they speak some in some particular provinces, they even have different um, dialects. So people, uh, when, uh, since, the, since the establishment of new China, people usually um, make, make the, uh, the way of speaking Chinese or the accent that is popular um, around Beijing area. We call it Putonghua, which means standard language. So that is Mandarin. So, um, so this is um, how Mandarin becomes the officially spoken uh, accent in, in mainland parts of China. So um, when you start to learn Mandarin or Chinese, nowadays, uh, usually across different parts of the world, you are most likely to learn Mandarin. Uh, Yes, but even for now, um, in China, in different parts of China, in mainland, um, people in different provinces they still speak with different accents at home. But usually at school, they speak Mandarin, and usually the accents um, is not very strong um, in different in many parts of China. So people can still communicate with each other. But in some provinces, such as um, in Zhejiang province or in Jiangsu province, um, their accents could be difficult. I mean, in some to some extent, it could be difficult, but usually they can always speak Mandarin. So even in uh, Guangdong province, they, um, that is a place where uh, Cantonese is popular spoken, but mostly people there, they could uh, speak Mandarin because this is what is taught at schools. So it is, um, it becomes very popular. So everyone from mainland of from mainland parts of China, uh, they can speak Mandarin. Another, I, I think another thing that is important for people to know is about the social media. Uh, is, and it is about what is usually um, broadcasting in the TV. Everything is in Mandarin, so people can understand that. Yeah, um, and Lydia, you, uh, the, look, the notion of Mandarin, of course, um, Mandarin is a word that goes back through Chinese history and so it has about it the the idea that this was the ruling the ruling elite that spoke this language. Um, now in Taiwan, Lydia, um, they've continued to speak uh, Mandarin. Um, can you tell us? Can you tell us why? Okay, I think well, 
originally, if you just count in the people, the indige indigenous Taiwanese, they actually speak Taiwanese. Or uh, maybe also their other dialects, their tribe dialects as well. But um, after the, uh, um, the Taiwan, the new Taiwan government, which is Jiang uh, the, the government flee to Taiwan uh, to, in 1945, of 1944, uh, around that time, then they bring Mandarin to Taiwan and then make it an official language in Taiwan. So that's what we've been told in Taiwan, like in school. Uh, at that time, all uh, if I ask my parents, their generation, they've been encouraged only speak Mandarin at school. And they got punished if they don't. Um, and then so at that time, that's the sort of the movement, um, the government movement to encourage people to just speaking Mandarin. Um, but people are still, um, but nowadays, uh, the government has now uh, encouraging people to keep their own mother tongue, so keep their own dialect. So the people at the south area, which is where I came from, they tend to speak Taiwanese, and the northern part of Taiwan, they speak um, some uh, Hakka as well. Um, and um, they are like my, like my grandparents, they they because they are they were educated by Japanese government, so they speak a bit of Japanese as well. So that's why I say well. But officially, Taiwan still, um, Mandarin is still our official spoken language. Good, and I'll, I'll move on. And uh, um, yes, so it's, it is the version that's, that's promoted more around the world. But then we also have Cantonese, and Cantonese is very much part of the, the southern provinces um, and the wider diaspora and was certainly the Chinese that was until recently um, the more common in Australia as well. Um, Tatiana, maybe you can tell us about Cantonese, what the difference is between Cantonese and Mandarin and um, uh, uh, the extent to which a, a strong regional language like this um, is still spoken. Now, um... The last point first. First of all, I think there are major differences between Cantonese and versus Mandarin uh, as as languages. But uh, I'll try to deal with that um, shortly later. First of all, on the word of uh, Cantonese, if you look at the first part of uh, the word, it is Canton, C-A-N-T-O-N, -N, which was actually the name in English for Westerners when they travel to um, Guangzhou uh, um, in China, Canton in China. Anyway, the name was Canton or is Canton because uh, Canton is the provincial capital of uh, uh, Guangdong province, uh, Guangdong. Now, uh, that's why, uh, first of all, so this is uh, the origin of the word Cantonese. So the language speak by people in Canton. Now, um, so, Nowadays, as far as, uh, as far as nowadays is concerned, it is the predominant spoken language in Hong Kong and Macau. And then for Guangzhou, that means Canton in mainland China, uh, it is still a very popular, uh, very common uh, language uh, spoken there. Um, I also observed that, uh, say, for ethnic Chinese coming from southern part of Vietnam, many of them or most of them actually uh, speak Cantonese, maybe even better than the Vietnamese. And then uh, there are quite many uh, ethnic Chinese in Malaysia and Singapore speaking uh, Cantonese as well. Having said that, I must say that uh, I admire ethnic Chinese uh, in Malaysia and Singapore because uh, most of them are multilingual, not just uh, between Mandarin and uh, Cantonese, but also English, Bahasa, Malay, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and some Indians, Indian as well. Uh, apart from Malaysia and Singapore, of course, uh, there are many ethnic communities in Australia, USA, Canada, and UK, who is uh, or who prefer to speak um, Mandarin, uh, beg your pardon, Cantonese as well. So this is uh, the present kind of uh, distribution as far as uh, the spoken language of Cantonese is concerned. Good, thank you. And look, we do have then a whole variety of smaller languages. And um, 
Uh, we have uh, Hakka, which is uh, uh, also comes from Guang, Guangdong, part of Guangdong. Guangdong is a very rich area, um, but is spread throughout Southeast Asia, um, even parts of Taiwan. We have variety Chao Chou, uh, which uh, also comes from uh, the, the same area that is spread throughout um, um, Southeast Asia. Um, Hokkien, uh, very widely spread again. Um, originally, this is from the Fujian province, um, but it's spoken throughout Southeast Asia. And that, that issue of multilingualism, I think, is, is really there. And then we have varieties of some of these, such as Timorese Hakka. Um, look, I will uh, turn off the uh, screen and Richard, can you please tell the audience um, what on earth they can, how they can work their way through these uh, uh, varieties. Um, there are so many varieties to, uh, to choose from and uh, why are they import important when organising interpreting services in particular? Yeah. Of course, um, no. In in terms of the the area that spoken in different dialects, say in Southeast Asia, the dominant sort of majority group is still the Hokkien people, Hokkien people, and then of course you had this Teochew, you had Cantonese, okay, also big number too. So so uh, the the input is there, uh, particularly the majority of the overseas Chinese are Hokkien and then, you know, Hokkien and then they also have very much input in the business, business area. Most of the business is run by them, you know. So, of course, the Cantonese also the same, they, because they got the number, then a lot of restaurants, the Cantonese, open, you know, it's also run by the Can Can Cantonese. So actually it's not difficult uh, because it's only in the overseas, they come to Australia. So it's mainly it's a Hokkien, Cantonese, uh, Teochew. Uh, a lot of Teochew actually is from Vietnam, you know, when they move in here. So they are Teochew people. Um, and then the Hakka, uh, because of the Timorese uh, sort of issue, then a lot of Chinese uh, came from T East Timor, they speak Hakka. So, but of course, there is some naughty boy. When they speak Hakka, they are from the Mei County, that is Mei Xian. They always say that their Hakka is East Timorese Hakka. Uh, actually, they use this after the independence of the East Timor. And they sort of say their Hakka is different from other, but actually it's not. It's quite similar, you know. Uh, so I actually go to talk to the community leader and say, how come you all, um, you, you all sort of make the Hakka different, you know. And he sort of said that I just come back from China. I went to the May County, they can't speak our language. <laughs> that means the people from May County cannot speak the, the May uh, Hakka, you know? So because they say that, I, I don't want to argue with them. No, I don't want, because I, I know that they are no, not much different. Of course, they are Hakka in different, you had different uh, county, the tone may be a bit different, uh, so so it is possible that uh, they are Hakka people, but they're not able to understand or communicate each other. You now, like you got the Popo Hakka, you now you got other. Like I went to the Sichuan because Sichuan, and I try to speak Hakka with them. I can't understand what they say. So the Sichuan also got the Hakka people. Because the Hakka people originally is from uh, Henan, that is south of the Yellow River. They spread down southeast and southwest. Southwest they end up in Sichuan, 
South East and now in Hokkien and, and, and Canton. And, but they all live in the mountainous area. So that is the specific sort of, uh, Hakka can, can have some very tight, you know, yeah. Good. We, um, we do have a lot of complications in these small languages, but I want to go on and actually show you um, what the uh, preponderance is of the, um, of the Chinese varieties in, in Australia. Um, oh, as well as the ones mentioned, there's also just uh, what we could call geographical varieties that, that just, for example, from a single city. So you can have a Sh Shanghaiese dialect yeah. or, or a dialect from other, other, other cities as well. Um, now, the, um, the census, the Australian census does not give easy statistics on all of these, but we can have a look at what the statistics are. Um, and um, now uh, it's very clear that, and this has really been what's happened in the last 20 years, is that Mandarin has overtaken Cantonese. Certainly 20 years ago, um, Cantonese would not, uh, would have been the predominant language. Um, and Mandarin uh, has overtaken that now, and that's been the influence of the last 20 years. Um, but you see there's a huge difference between those languages um, of Mandarin and Cantonese and the, and the smaller languages. The smaller languages are really, are really quite small in terms of the number of speakers who, can, uh, 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 who, who, um, uh, uh, who tell the census that they speak those languages. Um, uh, at this point, Fatih, did you have another question? Uh, thank you very much, Uldis. So I have a question from uh, Fatima, uh, who is the Executive Officer at Olive Tree Women's Network in New South Wales. And her question is, if a Cantonese speaker has not had formal education, will they be able to understand Mandarin? No. Hard to say. He, he may <laughs> or he may not. You know, <laughs> like not necessarily had to go to school to understand Mandarin. People can learn too. So, but mostly they don't. Now, if they are not educated, then mostly they they don't 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 cannot pick out the Mandarin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, we had to get the Cantonese uh, interpreter for them. Mm, yes, I did come across one uh, assignment where uh, the lady was actually uh, I was requested for like Mandarin interpreter, but then. Um, but then she actually speak Cantonese and we couldn't really communicate. I can understand what she said from many years of being in Australia, I pick up a, a bit of Cantonese, but then I couldn't, uh, we just basically couldn't communicate. We had to result in writing. And she told me that she could, haven't been to school as well. So, um, and she, she'd been living in Vietnam for most of her lifetime. She doesn't speak Vietnamese either. Yeah, so I think that fit into this situation 100%. And yeah, so in that case, you just have to request Cantonese interpreters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, and uh, if we can just go um, one further, one, one of the issues, of course, for language service providers is, um, well, we have these speakers in Australia. Um, what is their levels of English? And the census provides information on that because the census asks um, all people who speak a language other than English, what is their level of English? Do they speak it, it very well? Do they speak it well? Do they not speak it very well? Or do they not speak it at all? And these are the statistics, which shows a fairly um, consistent uh, percentage across, across the board. Um, the interesting one there is that the Hokkien speakers um, seem to be very proficient in English. Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of why that is the case. Uh, you, you may have some suggestions, but among the other, among the other languages, um, really we're getting about a quarter uh, of the people who report speaking that language at home, who will also report that they speak English not well or not at all. So these are quite um, important statistics, uh, and um, so given the the uh, well until this year, um, the particular increase in uh, uh, in um, uh, immigration from 
all areas of, of spoken Chinese, um, this uh, indicates that language services are really going to be busy for a very long period of time um, in these languages. Um, so this this is quite quite important um, to understand the breadth of this. Um, and Mandarin is now the um, the, the first uh, language other than English in Australia. Um, and Cantonese, uh, I think, is now third after Arabic. So um, these are, are very important uh, numbers and, and statistics that we have. Um, the census doesn't dig down into every, uh, every variety. I couldn't get figures on, for example, um, Timorese um, uh, Hakka, but um, the, um, as the numbers get quite small, um, but um, this indicates the depth of the of the of the issues. I'd like to go on and now getting the language services the requests right. And Tatiana has already covered this to some extent. Um, but uh, this, I suppose, again is the warning about um, uh, be careful of requests for Mandarin translation uh, or Cantonese translation. Um, should always ask for Chinese translations and then ask for simplified or traditional script. Now, very often there will be a one-to-one -one between Mandarin and the simplified script um, if the people come from the People's Republic of China. But if they come from elsewhere, uh, that may not be the case at all. Um, so, um, Tatiana, you, you, you referred to this earlier and and of requesting the right um, the right varieties in uh, in the um, uh, in the in the written language as well um, have you got any further comments on on this uh, because you mentioned the importance of providing both both varieties in many cases uh, yes uh, that's uh, that's true that's right and uh, thanks Udus. now um Allow me, uh, just now because I mainly commented on the translation requirements, then uh, it's about uh, uh, between traditional versus simplified, which is uh, more than just um, uh, the difference in complexity of the characters. Actually, if we talk about uh, interpreting of uh, local languages or main languages, the situation is even more uh, complex because, uh, in fact, uh, like the question raised by uh, one of our, our our audience, uh, in fact, we need to learn. We don't have to go to school, not necessarily going to school, but we have to learn in order to acquire another spoken Chinese language. So that's why, um, first of all, they are different because uh, not just in complexity of the characters, but also in their sem uh, semantic, uh, lexical, and once again, uh, even grammatical kind of things. So there are major differences between uh, these uh, local languages and uh, main language. Also, more importantly, they are mutually not intelligible. So that's what I'm trying to, uh, to say is um, they are quite different languages, no matter whether we call them local spoken language or a dialect. I think on the practical point of view, um, at the moment for most agencies in Australia, for Mandarin as well as uh, Cantonese interpreters, I think probably uh, we are, uh, the agency, are able to provide or to engage in uh, interpreters. But then for, for, uh, for the smaller languages, no matter whether we call them languages or dialects, even though the population is small, it is actually quite difficult to get a practitioner. So I think for the clients, uh, they really need to start early and be flexible uh, with regard to the date requirement, et cetera, and then inform the agency early uh, so that uh, there is a much better chance to engage uh, the, uh, the right interpreter for the job. Good. Can, Can I enjoy? add one thing that yeah, um, uh, uh, if people uh, ask yeah. for Cantonese translation, you give him the Mandarin translation, he can understand. Now, if you really write a truly Cantonese translation, he may not understand because it was quite complicated 
or the the wording is different and which is not very commonly sort of used at daily so the in terms of Cantonese script is harder to understand you know so if you give to Mandarin and that is commonly understood by people like that so probably there's no point to have Cantonese translation because it's harder for people to understand the the meaning. You know, I don't know. That is what I feel. You know, unless you had a much higher standard of uh, the language, then you can understand the Cantonese wording. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, just uh, one. Uh, uh, one. Two, one quick. Yeah. Quick Please. supplement. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we were never talking about Cantonese uh, translation just now. We were talking about um, trans, um, tr translation yes. between traditional versus uh, simplified characters, as well as interpreters uh, interpreting the spoken languages um, yep. between English and say Mandarin versus uh, between English and Cantonese. Okay, we'll get on to interpreting uh, in a minute. Um, Han Chu, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I I think I do have one point that I think is important that language service providers and also the agency that they need to know that is nowadays we have many softwares. I mean, even uh, even very small ones that um can convert uh traditional Chinese characters to simplified Chinese characters or vice versa. So um, I think what I want to recommend to uh, language service providers that is I think when we have um, some assignments for documents to be translated into traditional or simplified Chinese characters, it's important that we do not use those softwares because those softwares will only work at word level. While I think other panelists already mentioned that um, for, for depending on the target audience, um, the language are used in context, we have different ways of expression. So for example, if we need to have a document to be translated, to be read by someone from Taiwan, I think it's important that we have someone who are proficient in, you know, in writing or uh, doing translation for people who are from Taiwan, not like, you know, hiring someone maybe who can, uh, who work in simplified um, Chinese characters and then convert everything to traditional Chinese. So this is, I think that's not the right way to do it. Okay, we're getting onto the issue of uh, translation technology and uh, in the e era of Google Translation, this is becoming quite a, a significant issue. We'll get back to this on, on uh, uh, in, uh, also in terms of interpreting um, because this is this is uh, be becoming quite an important issue. Um, just to to go on, um, we should be super careful of requests for Chinese interpreting. You need to ask for the specific variety, and, and I think our panel has made that that very clear. Um, birthplace, yes, it could be uh, indicative, but it's not always indicative. Um, but one suggestion is that if, particularly if you've got very old, elderly Chinese, and, and some of the service providers might be in this situation, um, uh, many of the smaller varieties will not have professionally level, uh, level certified interpreters. Um, but very often, um, the people who are capable of interpreting in that variety do have professional level certification in Mandarin or Cantonese um, and therefore you're getting an interpreter um, who is qualified, ethical and they're not going to stuff up things in the smaller variety uh, in that case. Um, so uh, I think this is an important thing quite often if we're trying to match, uh, particularly with el elderly people, uh, and they and they'll speak a, a variety of Chinese that you have never heard of. Um, you can often find um, uh, certified interpreters of Mandarin or Cantonese who will speak that variety. And I think in this panel you've already seen the variety and the interchange of understanding of the different languages. And interpreters will will say yes, I can I can do that variety. The uh, language agencies 
uh, also keep uh, records of all the varieties that the interpreters speak, not only the varieties that they have professional certification in. So this, I think, is a very good um, uh, a very good suggestion, uh, and and it's it's uh, then matching exactly the variety that's that's sort of needed. Um, just moving on, so we talked about NATI classifications. NATI, the National Accreditation Authority for Translators and Interpreters, which sets the standards um, for interpreting in Australia. Um, so, uh, as already mentioned, Chinese is needed for translation um, because in the test the, the candidates choose which uh, which variety they they use, and then um, uh, the smaller varieties we mentioned only have provisional certification or what NATI calls recognition. In other words, the person is, is active in that area but has never been tested. Um, but often these interpreters will also be proficient in, uh, uh, in Cantonese or Mandarin. Um, so it, it is sometimes a bit of detective work. Uh, and if a person comes in and asks for a Chinese interpreter, these are the steps you need to go through. Uh, usually you can meet the needs, though it sometimes you could be scratching in the in 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 some of these smaller areas. Um, maybe uh, I could ask Richard at the moment. Um, are there are, are there we, we mentioned the 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 major smaller varieties, Hakka, Hokkien, Teochew, and so on. But there are many additional varieties, aren't they? And in some of them, we really don't have interpreters. Oh, now, now the Shanghainese, the request for Shanghainese uh, speaker, like that, you know. And uh, in the past, no, because they usually also speak Mandarin. So then they don't need, but now I don't know how it's happened because Shanghainese would more likely able to speak Mandarin. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a it's a detective game often to find out, particularly if it's if it's someone who's elderly, and and you're trying to work out um, uh, uh, how you can meet the demand. Um, but usually, if uh, if you ask the language service providers, okay, we need this variety. Do you have anyone who's who has got professional accreditation in another variety um, because professional accreditation or certification means you've got the ethics, you've got the skills um, and plugging in uh, the the other other variety which which could in some cases be actually the the home variety the the, the, the mother tongue of that particular interpreter um, is a way um, of going um, right. I want to go quickly through um, some issues of Chinese settlement in Australia. Now, um, this, of course, uh, you can have a, uh, uh, a 10 lecture series on uh, Chinese settlement in Australia because it's been so rich. But if I can just go through this quickly and we'll get on to um, the, uh, the issue of communicating with uh, Chinese communities and some issues there. Um, it was gold that brought many the first Chinese and significant numbers to Australia in the 1850s. Um, some of them discovered gold. Uh, more often, however, they became the business people supplying uh, the gold diggers for things. Um, and this was very significant, of course, because Chinese is one of the great one of the great trading cultures. And this, this emphasis on trade and business, um, which Richard has already mentioned, uh, I think Richard has mentioned, um, is, is really important. However, in that um, particular situation, there was antagonism to the Chinese miners. There were conflicts. There were some quite reasonably documented massacres of Chinese. This was not an easy, um, uh, an easy uh, um, situation. Um, but certainly that led to, uh, uh, to uh, anti-Chinese feeling. However, the Chinese 
continue to come and continue to be entrepreneurs. Um, the next stage in when Australia became a federation, the very first um, act that the Australian Parliament passed was the Immigration Restriction Act. And this had come about because previously every single colony in Australia was six different colonies, would have different rules on entry of people in or out. So you could have one policy when, uh, um, when uh, 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 Australia became a federation. Um, the Chinese who were here were still allowed to stay, but there were restrictions on further immigration. Um, and the Chinese who were here at that time were largely from this southeastern Asia diaspora. Some were from mainland China, um, but many more from areas of Malay, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, etc. Um, the whole the whole peninsula diaspora. Um, the uh, uh, and so this meant that. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the, the Chinese numbers in Australia gradually dropped from 1901 through to the 1970s. Um, I'm uh, unfortunately old enough to remember what Chinatown looked like in the 1950s and 1960s, and it looked like nothing now. It was a dusty place with a few old men, hardly any women, sitting around waiting. That was the image, what was going to happen. With the um, changes to the White Australia policy, particularly, uh, oh, so, yeah, um, but before we get to the changes, um, there was one other way in which Chinese could get to Australia. In World War II, China was an ally of the Allied forces against Japan in this theater of war. Um, there were Chinese who fled to Australia. Uh, they were allowed to stay, um, particularly after the Chinese Revolution of 1949. So there was a small increase, um, but certainly not a major increase uh, of uh, uh, Chinese settlers. The White Australia policy, um, while there were gradual moves to restrict it and, and, and end it, um, really, the White Australia policy, for all intents and purposes, in terms of practical immigration, um, uh, ended with the Vietnam War. Before that, there were some exemptions made. If you were a, a, a scholar for a university position or something like that, you could get in. There were some exceptions for business people in particular areas. Um, but really, it was only after the Vietnam War that we got substantial uh, immigration from Asia and the White Australia policy was 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 ended once and for all. Um, the uh, there was some increase in Chinese immigration, but the biggest uh, effect was uh, after Tiananmen Square in 1989. Um, the Hawke government at that time allowed the Chinese students to to um, to uh, to stay. Um, and uh, those who wanted to stay, and uh, they brought their families, and that has really been the surge of the Chinese immigration, but in particular, the Mandarin-speaking um, immigration and the simplified script immigration, but there's also more from Hong Kong and Southeast Asia. Um, so there's significant increase in Chinese immigration now, um, and as we've seen, the um, Mandarin numbers have now overhauled the, the Cantonese, uh, and this has been a really significant uh, change in Australia. Um, and uh, uh, you are all familiar with the Chinatowns in the major cities now, um, and it is a very long uh, way from what, the, what they looked like in the 1950s when it really looked like um, they would have no future at all. So it's really been these political changes, um, changes to immigration policy um, that has led the, uh, the, uh, the Chinese here. Now, of course, there's a lot of history in China, in, a lot of interest in Chinese history 
There are Chinese museums in the major cities. Um, you can see all of this history of Chinese immigration uh, and, and that's been very significant. So uh, our final part, communication with the Chinese communities. And um, one thing, uh, Chinese tend to be very technology savvy uh, and not just young Chinese. Um, uh, the younger Chinese have been teaching their older Chinese and so on. And uh, I, uh, I think this is important also for language service providers because um, uh, translation of a formal kind, well, um, uh, it, it's, it is now supplemented by other means of reaching communities. And I'd like to ask the panel what their experience has been of um, the tech-savvy Chinese communities and what are good ways of reaching these communities. Yeah, I'd like to start off. Can I start first? Yeah, yeah, um, please. Because so, um, um, I'm from mainland parts of China, so um, I will just talk about how to reach out to um, Chinese groups in mainland parts of China. I want to talk about two social media apps. So the first one is WeChat. We've already have it here. So WeChat is like, I think, one of the most popular communication apps in mainland parts of China now. It is increasingly used by other um, I think people from other parts of the world, it is, um, you know, the main communication tool that is used, I guess, for people from, um, who people who are from like 10 years old to in their maybe 80 or 90 years old. My grandma, she's in her, she's almost 90 years old. She's using WeChat. So it is very popular. So usually we have, um, in our Chinese um, cultural group, we have China-based language service providers or agencies. They have their own public account that is based in WeChat. You could send out notification or advertisement through WeChat. It is very popular. And the other one that I want to mention is called Weibo. So it is very popular. It is like it is like the Chinese version of Twitter. In fact, many uh, Australian universities they have their accounts in Weibo. It is very popular. So um, I think those are the two uh, main uh, ways for you to reach out to potential clients. And also the other one, TikTok. It is a short video sharing app now. Um, I'm not sure um, how um, language service providers, I think it is. it could also be used widely if your advertisement is in the form of short video. But mm -hmm. sorry to add, that is TikTok is mainly used by young people. I mean, usually people, you know, less than 30 years old or a younger generation, I would say, yes. <laughs> and WeChat is used by you. Um, the other one you mentioned, sorry, which is not uh, uh, on, on the list here, it's called Weibo. It's W E I B O. W E I B O. Ah, yes, yes. I think I've seen that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, Lydia, uh, are you in the age of of people who uses um, uh, social media, and do your parents and grandparents use it? Oh uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, for people in Taiwan, we use another app. Um, it's very similar to WeChat, um, which is called Line. Uh, Line app is actually developed in South Korea. So I assume that probably South Korea people use it too. And um, so it's sim very, it's pretty much similar to WhatsApp that's being used in Australia. Um, and uh, apart from all these social medias, um, you still can send through SMS. I just find with a lot of um, the net clients that I in touch with, they are quite comfortable receiving information in message forms. Um, sometimes if you call them through um, phone, they just get panic if that's not a number they are familiar with. Or if you just speak man, uh, in English, they, they panic. But if you send information through all different social media or into a message form, they feel a lot more comfortable. And then also uh, they can get in touch with all different uh, translation um, kits and then they can translate the content. Um, so I think in the mean of communication, um, social 
platform by social those using to well use this social platform is quite quite a good idea good because um of course uh now most standard translations are no longer done for little brochures that we we have sitting on shelves but are done for websites and increasingly um not only government but ngos and other organizations will use their websites for for information um, uh, rather than having written translations but i think uh, what's important also is of course now we have um, radio stations certainly in the major cities uh, we have Chinese radio stations um, and um, on, uh, use of websites um, uh, quite often things like uh, using graphics or voiceovers um, can be quite effective rather than always written translations um, they may include some translations but um, it, it, it's a uh, a different way of getting to uh, to particular audiences, and and I think that's really um, uh, there's now um, many uh, organisations are thinking of creative ways, um, for example, using more graphics, um, sometimes with very minimal text to communicate issues to people. Um, we've seen some attempts uh, of that during the the, the COVID uh, crisis here. Um, so I think there's a lot of other, other media around. Um, one issue that I think is, is important um, is uh, to consider with the Chinese communities, um, whether they're the very older established, maybe the, the Cantonese speaking or the newer um, ones from uh, the People's Republic, um, is the uh, family focus and this issue of Confucianism uh, and so on. And uh, I think some people uh, perhaps are not very clear about this. They've heard of Confucianism. They, they know it's related to Chinese culture. Um, but maybe we can spend just a few minutes um, maybe talking about what is Confucianism. Um, I know we can talk about this a lot, but um, who, would, who would like like to go first? Uh, maybe Tatiana, I'll, a few words on uh, Confucianism and I'll turn it off so we can see you fully. Yeah, okay, I will try to be very brief and uh, quick. Now on this point about family focus and Confucianism influence in all Chinese cultures and communities, I think we need to note that uh, for Chinese socio-cultural values, um, actually um, it's, it's about ideal virtues for individuals, as well as ideal relationship between the individual and the family, as well as between the individual and the country. Because of the rise and fall of different dynasties in China in the past 2000 years to date, it often also brought about uncertainties and economic hardship. So as a response to this situation, and also because of uh, the influence of uh, Confucianism, of not uh, being at odds, say, with the government, etc. Uh, ordinary Chinese people are avoiding politics, and many of them have turned to wealth creation, which is understandable and uh, is all okay, in order to protect themselves and their families against instability and uh, mater uh, material hardship. So from the micro point of perspective, I believe that uh, Confucianism has influence on the ethnic Chinese at least at two levels. First of all, it is at the family level. There was almost absolute respect and obedience uh, to one's parents, especially the father. And then at the national level, most people respected and obeyed the emperor and government officials without reservation. So I will stop here. Good, right. Yes, who'd like to go on a bit more about Confucianism because it, it is it is a, an area of values which uh, uh, I think intrigues uh, many people outside of China as well. Yeah, it's uh, Confucianism is just a very general philosophy of life. You now, how to conduct your living and all those things. And I was surprised that the Australian government side was uh, not, not, not really uh, 
able to accept the Confucius uh, sort of institute and the center. I was surprised, you know. Uh, it is um is I feel it wouldn't be doing any harm. It would be a sharing the cultural understanding. Uh, it's us tell people to do the right thing, you know, to do the good thing like that. So, um, so it, it's it's a, a bit of surprise for me that Confucius uh, Institute you not know, have been treated. So I'm surprised. <laughs> Maybe the authority make the wrong move. Yeah, I I think that's a part of wider politics, which is there. Yeah, Lydia, please. Yes. I guess just to add on to that, because Taiwan does use Confucianism as a teaching concept uh, for um, ethics in ta for the people in Taiwan. Um, so it focused on a lot of uh, pro uh, pro 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 propriety, righteousness, benevolence, um, different uh, sense of honor or, or different uh, concepts. And um, so it does. Um, so what like what Dr. Cho was saying before, um, the, the, to have ultimate respect for the parents and also for teachers um, that are all form like a really strong um, beliefs in sort of Chinese culture. And um, and I, I often come across when um, when I'm doing my interpreting assignment uh, um, like you can you can tell like people even without understanding can even though they have limited English, but because we were told to be polite and having good manners, so we keep the eye contact. So they will keep not nodding when the professional asking questions or, uh, or keep smiling when the professional are asking questions or trying to, yeah, that, that's just the way, the no natural way of people being polite. But however, they couldn't really understand what uh, the professional is saying. They will tend to the interpreter for help. Yeah, so just say like, uh, when, um, and also usually professional would tend to ask, oh, do you understand? Or oh, do you have any questions? I think being, like, Australia always ask this, but then Chinese people will always reply, yes, no, no questions. And they will come up with something. Because <laughs> it's just a nature, like, um, yeah, it's just a sense of um, propriety of, of um, keeping the eye contact being responsive to people's questions, but not really exactly understand what the person is saying. So yeah, this is just from my observation. Um, right, uh, uh, Hanshu, anything to add on Confucianism? Or, okay. Or it's okay, so Confucianism, I think first we need to understand who is Confucius. Confucius is, um, he, he's, um, I think he's maybe one of the most influential educator in China. So he he's actually, um, a very ancient historical figure. He, um, I think he lived in more than 2000 years ago. The reason why he is so famous in China and so influential in Chinese culture is because of his teaching philosophies or his philosophy about how to be a good human being or how to rule a country. Um, and uh, one important, another thing that, um, that is important is um, his philosophy and his um, thinking um, accepted by many emperors in the Chinese history. So uh, many emperors actually promote his idea, his thoughts. So his ideas about how to be polite, how to be, uh, show respect to your parents, to your teacher, are very influential in traditional Chinese, uh, for, for, for Chinese people. I think even for all, for, for all of us present today, for all the panelists, even we speak, you know, we come from different Chinese groups. I mean, culturally, or we uh, we speak different uh, varieties of Chinese. But I think we share the same cultural value to some extent, and most of these cultural values they are from Confucius. So he's very influential, and many of his um, his his thoughts, his books, his ideas, they are still taught in schools nowadays. Um, in I think in basically um, any parts of the world that um, uh, that uh, where uh, that promotes Chinese culture so it is very influential I would say yes good thank you very much and uh, look we're coming to the um, to the uh, end of, of, of our presentation just a couple of, of, of uh, points 
here to finish off. Um, one thing that uh, Tatiana already mentioned is this strong uh, emphasis on business, on entrepreneurship, on trade, uh, being merchants. Um, and um, I, I think this is, uh, uh, you will see this in the number of um, small businesses. Um, uh, and this seems to be a sort of a feature of Australian migration. Uh, how come the Greek shop has now become the Chinese shop? Um, and we see that <laughs> we see that everywhere, and we see this very very strong merchant culture, uh, entrepreneurial culture that is that is there. Um, I suppose one last thing about the Chinese communities is that um, look at the moment it's not a happy relationship between Australia and China, and I don't think anyone can. Um, would, would be uh, um, surprised to hear that. Um, uh, while um, for the most part, you won't be preparing material and getting it translated, um, that'll be um, in any way politically controversial, um, but it is an idea just to get a second reading of it to make sure that there's no unconscious bias or, or something that, that, that that has, has come into the text uh, in terms of characterizing the Chinese communities or so on. Um, uh, obviously, if you have things to say about China, you should say them uh, in your documentation. Um, but um, I think uh, being aware uh, uh, to be on guard for anything that's unintentionally um, going to exacerbate um, things in, in, this, in this context. Um, We've come to the end, and just to show you, um, yes, Hanshu, um, how do you say thank you in your variety? <laughs> I'll say that again, xie xie. Okay, uh, and <laughs> Tatsiano, how do you say thank you in your variety? Well, in Cantonese, it would be to jie or in Gai. <laughs> yes, there's different varieties for different um, situations even. Uh, Lydia? Yeah, okay, so there's a, a choice there. And Richard, you can choose any one of your many wonderful varieties um, to say thank you. Oh, I just use the first one, that is you No, know, easy to, to, to say and easy to understand, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. I, say two, two thanks, you know. Yeah, I, I <laughs> thanks think, and thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think this year is becoming the 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 more um, uh, the one more often often heard now. Um, I'd uh, like to um, just finish um, with a word from all graduates. Um, this is part of a whole series of. Uh, seminars on cultural familiarization um, and um, all graduates is very much concerned with spreading knowledge of the communities that our interpreters and translators work in um, and perhaps we could have a closing word from Fatih from all graduates. Indeed, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aldous, and thank you very much to all our panelists. And of course, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending today. Uh, we hope that you found today's webinar on Chinese culture and language helpful. Um, you can visit our YouTube channel uh, as well as our website for more cultural awareness sessions. Uh, we've run one on Chin and Burmese language and culture, as well as uh, Kurdish language and culture. Uh, and you can also find other webinars there. For example, we have one on cultural competence as well. Uh, so please keep an eye on the website and the YouTube channel. Um, and uh, like we said, we will make these uh, webinars available for free on our YouTube channel and you will get the recording link to this um, tomorrow as well as your certificate of attendance. Now, if you wanted to uh, access today's handouts, we have Dr. Aldous's slides available as a PDF. Uh, you can download that from the GoToWebinar app, should you wish to. Um, so thank you again for attending today and um, have a lovely thank holiday you. season and uh, Happy New Year. Follow us for more training opportunities in 2021. And uh, thank you to Dr. Aldous and all our panelists again. All the best. Thank you.